So we go through and set those. Um, All right. And now we'll go through some methods. Okay. Hmm. Um, and just describe why each one is useful, why it's necessary, what the parameters are, and then what it does. So what its first method is cancel offer. It's denoted that it's a method with the at method decorator. And it says anyone can pay none, which means that none of the inputs or the outputs are signed except for the, except for the one that's being uh, redeemed. Correct. Mm -hmm. This is a right. public method. Means that Meaning. anyone can call it. Mm -hmm. Right. So private methods you can't call. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, it accepts one parameter, which is the signature. Mm -hmm. Provided by the person that wants to cancel this offer. Right. Two assertions are made. The first one is that this contract must be in an offer state. Mm -hmm. And say so it does one check, which is that checks the signature is Alice's because Alice is the mm -hmm. person offering. Right. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. Presenting the offer. So she right. can cancel. Yeah. Okay. okay. Purpose of this is so that if Bob uh, leaves her hanging, doesn't respond, she can just get it back. Mm -hmm. If Bob stands her up on the date. Yep. <laughs> right. No, sir. Right. All right. Next method. Uh, Okay. In the yellow at method decorator, but this time the sick hash is in a single, which means none of the inputs are signed, but there is one output that is signed that you care about. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so this is accept offer. And as it says in the comments, Bob can accept the offer by doubling the money in the contract and adding his number. This is a method that allows Bob to accept the offer from Alice. Uh -huh. It's two params. The signature uh, required to accept this offer in Bob's number. Uh -huh. And does Bob know the number provided by Alice at the time he picks his number? Uh -huh. yeah. Nope. And uh, we covered why not. Yeah. Right. Because it's blinded. <laughs> so, first two assertions that are made. Um, first one make sure that this contract is. Yeah, is in an offer state. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it shows that error. Um, the second one is that Bob's signature, that the signature that was provided, is actually from Bob. based on public key that's provided to the game mm -hmm. by Alice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Bob's number has to be a string to zero or one. Next, mm -hmm. it is uh, it's to Bob's. Oh, yeah. So Bob's number is the state. Mm, has to be Except updated. To the one that's yeah. passed. You know. Saved. Saved. Yeah. Yeah. And then the contract state yeah. is incremented to one. Yeah. Yes. Because now we're in the accept state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are all these ends? Why is it one end? Do you not big end. Big <laughs> number. Because I right. assume if you just left it at one, then it would be uh, what type number or something which would be invalid. Uh, yeah. You can see that here. Yeah. Yep. That's why. Right? Yep. And then we want to construct a new output. Um, <laughs> the word works. Redeeming the old one. Yeah. And well, then yeah. we saved the state and the contract. Uh huh. So we want to build out a new output with the new state and everything. And it incorporates. To that new state. To them. Yeah. yeah. In the new output script that we're creating with that output. Yes. And it has a value that's doubled because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, because. Wait, wait, because Bob's put it in. Offer. Yeah. Because Bob's added Okay, it. yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. This has just been negotiating. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bob has doubled and, and, mm -hmm. um. Yeah, so this is the new output, output that can be later redeemed by either Bob or Alice, depending yeah. on who wins. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a piece of lesson. Mm -hmm. We hash the outputs because we're um, using sig hashing when a single. So we care about this new output. Mm -hmm. Which that means why? hash has to include it. Yeah. In the pre image. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then we assert that, that the, um, the hash outputs have mm -hmm. been updated, I guess, to include. Anyway. Well, 
we assert that CPX pre uh, the, the CPX hash outputs, meaning the hash outputs from the you know the hash of the outputs in this transaction that were uh -huh. included in this particular pre-image that we validated by CPX, right? And yes. To the um, hash outputs that we expect, which is the single output that he uh -huh. updated state of this. Yeah. Hmm. So if you didn't call um, line seventy-seven, I'm just sticking. No, let's um this this line seventy-six update CTX dot hash outputs. Yes, it actually it updates update. the uh, the pre-image by doing that. It doesn't update it now. No. No. How does that happen? You well, well but it right. Uh, if if line uh, seventy three and seventy four weren't there, maybe they were commented. Uh -huh. The output produced by line seventy six would look different, right? Yeah, but we're just computing a value here on line seventy six. We're not updating anything. We're saying no, well, you can yeah, what this contract like. In new oh, article, I see. Different. Yeah, because it goes into your output. Constant, and then you actually hash that. And we're checking and it against it. Everything check. we're doing is just checking, checking. Yeah, checking, it's all checking. Yeah, okay. Everything that's ever in a smart yeah. contract right. is just checking. Yeah. So it's check. only it's only member variables that can actually be mutated. Uh -huh. And so because of the mutations that happen on seventy three and seventy four, yeah. when we call the function build state output, it's going to go and go through all of your member variables as they currently stand. Okay. But you assemble a theoretical output that would be with uh, with them as they currently are. Okay. And the parameter that it takes is what? Mm, goodness, that's clever. The, yeah, the value. Mm -hmm. It's the number of Satoshis uh -huh. that would be in such a theoretical output. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow, that's clever. That's updating anything. <laughs> no. Yeah. The point of that is just to verify. Verify, verify, verify. Yeah. That's all you ever do. Script. Nothing updates anything else. No, always verify only. Um, so we're saying that's offer. I'm just trying to understand why. So it's the point is to check that what Bob provides a output that doubles it. In his transaction, yes. Yeah, he has right? to. Isn't that what you're demanding, a Bob? <laughs> yes. He's right. put, he's put, um, it, it says it in the next line. Right. Bob must double. The yeah, money. I, I know I get that. That's, that's just the error message. The this mechanism call. by which he doubles it mm. is this mechanism, right? Huh. He has to come up with some input from some other place that we don't care about. Yeah. Right. That's why anyone can care. Sure. Yeah. Such that the transaction in totality is valid, number one, but but we don't care where he is. He has to come up with some input from some other place such that there can mm. be an output that he must include, which would be the version of the theoretical output created on 76. That is, as we say, based on the current state of the member variables as have now been updated by line 73 and 74. Boom. Right? Yes. Okay. Right. Okay, I, I think I understand that. So accepting offer, it, this is creating a new output that is Double the value because Bob is contributing to it as well. Yes, mm -hmm. he has to. You see the input from Alice and the input from yeah. Bob. Yes, okay. yeah, exactly. The input from so Alice is, this... is the contract. Yeah. And the input this from is just Bob verifying that the value is two times that. In the new mm -hmm. output, the new one that Bob is now. So Bob accidentally gave a little bit extra somehow. I see. Yeah, he has to. Mm. How else could he do it? Right? No, I mean, if he gave too much, or oh. something, then it wouldn't. Well, we're asserting this multiplied by. That's too bad. 
there's no less than or greater than here. Mm. But you should. There's a sort of accept offer returns a locking script, right? Oh, it returns uh, an unlocking script when you call it, which is the one that would redeem, right? But hmm. but remember that that's going to be part of a transaction that must also include. Otherwise, that theoretical output that we're creating on line 76 would not come to fruition in the assertion. That's when you actually check what hash outputs are. Right? We accept is the locking or unlocking. Well, what are public functions of a contract? I thought they were unlocking. They are unlocking. You're right. Mm -hmm. But to unlock, what must be true? There's quite a few things. <laughs> These things must be true. Right. right. And one of the things that must be true is in order that to he's unlock... put in the, the same as Alice has. Right. Yeah. It. Okay. Right. All right. Moving on. So he's put it's a number. So he has to have given a number. He has to have given the same amount as Alice has given. Mm -hmm. And the uh, contract state must say that he's in the acceptance state. And the, re the resulting UTXO must look like that created by 76. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that when Bob well, creates Bob a transaction... Yeah. yeah, when Bob creates a transaction that spends the output that originally Alice made, right? Hmm. First, Alice Which made an offer. offer. Output. Yeah. First, Alice made an offer. Then yes. Bob spent that offer, but in order to spend that offer from to accept, right? Yes, why he's spending it? That offer, right? It lives on, right? Bob can't just accept that offer by spending it for free, and then just mm. not doing anything. He has got to come up with a way to make this assertion be true. Other, otherwise, he couldn't spend it. Yeah, yeah. And in order to do that, the assertion is that the transaction that Bob made. Uh, must include what? An output where the total value is twice the amount of the original. And where the state variables, the member variables mm -hmm. of such a represented output have been set. Have been set according to 73 and 74, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's in the next state. Yeah. We getting more solid? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, moving up. So, line okay. 82. So next public method, uh, you only can pay and none. So we're not signing over any of the inputs or outputs. Except for the one that we're redeeming. Yeah. Uh huh. So this is a public method called Alice Reveals Winner. And so it says Alice Reveals her Number and the winner gets the money. So, yeah, so the signature is provided, and Alice. Ons and Alice number. Mm -hmm. um, first assertion is that well, why are the um, why are the why are those three parameters uh, mm -hmm. going to be provided? We'll, we'll see how they're useful down below. Right. Okay. So <laughs> the contract state is one, which means that Bob must have accepted the offer, so not zero, which would be the um, offer state. Okay. Yeah. And Alice's nonce must be 32 bytes, just to make it more uh, random. So now we're going to go down to hash for verification. And this is where we'll see how Alice's nonce is used. Mm -hmm. So we're going to hash uh, the nonce that was provided, the random piece of data, um, with Alice's number. And we're going to check that that hash is equal to the Alice's hash that was originally provided. Okay, what this does is it uh, prevents Alice from being able to change her number um, because the hash would be different. Um, and it also, yeah, and then without, makes it so Alice have to reveal her number to Bob, so then he could cheat. And down to the next assertion, which is making sure that Alice's number is either zero or one. If Bob and Alice's numbers are the same, then Alice wins, and given that she can provide the Alice signature to unlock, otherwise Bob wins. Mm -hmm. Right. And the contract simply releases the outputs to be used however they will be used by whoever signs. To either one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So Alice initially created an output. Bob spent it, created 
next iteration of it. Or not. Just a second state. Yeah. The third state could either be uh, spent by or created by Alice or Bob. Right. By who wins. Correct. Okay. Right. Hmm. The final boss. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, there's another method. Sakashi, you can pay none. All right. Bob wins automatically after delay. So if we are in the accept state and Bob has provided a valid signature hmm. and the time has expired, then they all agree at the beginning hmm. that they're agreeing that um, the amount of time for which this is supposed to happen by. Then Bob can uh, get the reward when them hot. Hmm. Right. And what's the final one? Transition? Oh, this is a transition state. This is not a public method. Looks oh. like it says you state Bob's number. Oh, so this is a helper oh. method. Sorry, you uh, you said method. that yes. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So you could just call it and it would transition to the next. Yeah, this is not used in any of the public methods. Right. Are you using it anywhere? Yes. We'll get into wider context oh. deployment stuff, and I think that's where we'll end for today after we go through the deployment. Right. All right. That's Understand all. how this contract works. It's a whole contract. Right. Any questions? All <laughs> <laughs> right. Now we understand the terms and conditions of this contract. And when you play that coin flip with me on stage, Brayden, on in London, yeah. Now you will understand what you're actually agreeing to. Yeah. I, I will understand too. I didn't realize that it would be this complicated. To be honest. Well, you, you just. Understand it. I do now, but you know, when somebody said, Oh, just write a contract for coin flip, you know, oh, yeah. you think it would just be 10 lines. Ah. <laughs> did you? What, yeah, lines. yeah, I know. It, uh, what did you think, Brad? Did you think it would uh, need to be this sort of complicated? No, I mean, part of it, but this is actually simpler versus all the stuff we looked at the real low level Bitcoin script. Right. <laughs> you guys want to see this on chain? Oh okay, yeah, yeah. We'll see that. Let me go to the men and line successfully, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where's that in the chat? We'll have that. So we can mm-hmm. cut this part out. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll cut. We'll cut back to it once. Okay. So here's the first successful coin flip transaction that actually uses this contract. So this is actually the redeem of it, but I'll trace it back, and then I'll say, okay, let's look at where this was, and then I'll trace this one back further. So let's look at. Uh, this one. So this is where we actually, Alice funded this with some inputs and created an output, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And that output contains, you know, 644 Satoshis. So let's just look at uh, how this is script here. No, that's not. Right, let's actually go to uh, the, the script opcodes. Mm-hmm. There's some, some opcodes. Okay. Well, wow. Um, and it goes on. <laughs> Man, wow! Split, nip, knock, false, false. You, you can go through that line by line, right? <laughs> yeah, false, yeah, false. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, and let's actually uh, show really how large this is. If I go to the scripts tab, mm-hmm. so there's so, yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. And so this is all shower ways. That's crazy. Well, this is compiled code. Yeah. This is like a .exe file on Windows, only for Bitcoin. Mm. A compiled version of the code. Yeah. And it's that large. But that's the entire contract. Mm. These are the terms and conditions. <laughs> <laughs> this, right. Do you agree to the terms and conditions? Yeah. It's like the new version of... Uh, sorry, I'm going to read your record. Right. <laughs> yeah. So how do we read the terms and conditions then? You paste in your source code, you say. Well, does it match? That's one way of doing it. There's a script validator thing where you can actually say, okay, well, let's actually grab the, you know, uh, there's a few that you can run and it'll actually check it. Recent and I perform. Uh, um, sometimes. Mm. Um, but, but what I can say is, um, this, uh, this contract contains some 
you know, this this huge locking strip, right? This was Alice's uh this was Alice's kind of original offer mm-hmm. of six forty four, right? Then it went into Bob consuming. So this is the uh acceptance. Bob spent six forty four. Yeah. And he created, remember, Sighash single. So what does Sighash single mean? Right? We talked about this. They have to mm. be sitting across the table from each other, yes. right? Yeah. Uh-huh. And here they are, right? If I flip yeah. these outputs though, or if I flip the input to a different one, uh-huh. anyone can pay. But it, you know, I could flip the in, I could flip the um, you know, I could move this guy up by one. Mm. And I could move this guy down by one. As long as I also move this guy yeah. down by one and this guy up so by it's one, always, right? yeah, opposite. I'd still be sitting across for myself. Yes. That's what sig hash symbol is. Even if anyone can pay, right? Yeah. Okay. Now you can understand the purpose of these sig hash flags, how they work. Mm. So yeah. spent the 644 and created double that. What's double 644? Well, there you go, 1288. Hey. Nice. So had to do that. Otherwise, this would not have been a valid spend, right? If this was 1287, what would it have spent? Would this transaction be valid? No, oh, no, it wouldn't, because it wouldn't have been doubled. Yeah. Uh-huh. Times two means times two. Yeah. No if ands or buts about it. So output got created by that. Then it got spent by the winner. 1288 Satoshis got used as input. And then captured by the person who claimed yeah. the winnings. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yep. And there's a TXID for posterity. <laughs> so there that is. That's, That's how that works. Right. But I asked a question earlier that we kind of didn't go through fully. Mm. Which is how do you read the terms and conditions, right? How do you actually um how do you actually make sure that what you're looking at is what you think it is? And this gets into overlays a little bit and we'll get there eventually. Not today, but Mm. We'll get there like straight off when we go into the next one because we'll understand this and we'll review it. Mm. Um, so this operations file. Yeah. Uh, we have an offer and an acceptance and we understand the architecture of this contract now. So we can run through this file. And what I'm going to do is first I'm going to run through this at a high level. Uh, I would have you guys try to go through and guess what this is. Maybe we'll review it again next time mm-hmm. uh, in more detail and we'll then build our understanding out from there. What I want to do for today is provide a, a high level summary of this. Yep. And uh, then we will go into more detail in the future. We can ask questions, of, of course, ask questions, but we, uh, we went through most of it yesterday, didn't we? We went through a very, very small amount of it. Mm-hmm. No, this is like 500 yeah. lines. So I'm going to go through some of it. Mm-hmm. I won't go through all of it. We went through like part of create. We went like create to cancel offer, and that was it. Yeah. Um, so we're importing, of course, the tokenator from. Average tokenator. And so if you don't understand what that is, it's just like a messaging bus between two users, right? It's like you can send messages from Alice to Bob and they can talk to each other. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, we then have some, uh, Babbage SDK functions, which is how you actually create transactions using the standard wallet and, um, you know, get public keys and things. We're then using some S script helpers. And we talked at the very beginning of the first episode. Of this about how to actually import a contract. Yep. We talked at the very beginning uh, a little while ago about how to import these things. Um, we make a new tokenator instance. That's not too important. Um, it's just a way for people to talk to each other. And then we've actually got a um, a few functions here. Verify truth. That's a helper. I'll skip that one. We have an incoming challenge interface so that Bob and Alice can actually talk to each other about challenges. Mm-hmm. It has an ID, which is a challenge ID. Has who's the challenge from? What's the amount of the challenge? Yeah. Uh, what's the transaction that is of the offer? Right. right. So I actually look at the offer itself. Yeah. And we'll talk about how to actually read the terms and conditions to see what I'm being offered. Right. Mm-hmm. It's got the choice, meaning who did the challenger choose? Did they choose heads or tail? That's cosmetic. It's not actually used by the challenge contract. It's used by just the UI to show a heads or a tails yeah. on the coin. Yeah. Make that work. And I've got an expiry, which is when does this challenge expire? Yep. So when Alice creates a challenge, uh, there was a big for loop in here that we glossed over before. Yes. But let's think of all the things that Alice wants to do when she creates a challenge, right? Alice wants to make a transaction that makes an offer, send the offer to Bob, see if Bob is going to accept or reject, and then reveal the winner to Bob 
And if the winner is herself, Alice wants to claim the money from Bob and get it back. And if, if Bob rejects, then, uh, you know, Alice is going to claim he's, she's going to cancel the offer. And if Bob um, uh, times out, she's going to cancel. Hmm. And if uh, if Bob wins, then she's going to be honorable and send him uh, the fact that he won just to uh, be honorable and, and, and whatnot. Uh, or she could just drop off the face of the earth if she was malicious, but hmm. uh, she's going to actually, in this case, uh, be honorable. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. So we understand that that is the thing. Those are the things that Alice wants to do when she wants to challenge Bob. Right. Yep. Yeah. So there are some types here. Um, and let's just look at the interface to begin with. So this is a large function that's going to do all of those things that I just described on behalf of Alice. Mm. This is a function that runs on Alice's computer. It's called create challenge. It's asynchronous. Uh, you pass in Bob's identity public key. You pass in the amount that you want to challenge Bob for, and you pass in what your choice is, heads or tails. Mm -hmm. And eventually, that's either going to return rejected, expired, you win, or they win. Mm. After everything is done. Uh -huh. So that's what like, a UI developer would need in order to build a UI on top of this, from Alice's perspective. right? Uh, maybe there would be some progress indicators, some other things, but that would be about it from a functionality perspective. So first thing, right, what did we decide that Alice needed to do? She needed to create a nonce so that she could uh, blind her value effectively mm -hmm. and that way hide it from Bob. Yep. So she does so. And this is just a, it's a, it's a byte string that comes from a random number generator that computes a hex, which then goes into a byte string. So this is some browser, some web browser code but basically it computes a random 32 byte byte string. Mm -hmm. That's Alice's knots. Then Alice is going to pick a random value zero or one, which is a big int, which comes from a rounded random number between zero and one, meaning this just picks a big int that is zero or one. Right. right? Uh -huh. Yep. Then Alice is going to um, create a uh, choice for herself, uh, which is computing the a byte string version of that number at the, at that, that big end. And so it converts int to byte string and you pass in any um, uh, integer, big int, and then you also pass in the size and it computes a correctly sized byte string with that uh, size. So that's how int to byte string works. So Alice then computes the hash of the uh, nonce plus her uh, Alice choice, just like we're gonna verify later, right? So. Alice does this ahead of time on line 54 in this file, right? And this is like the same exact code, basically. SHA-256 is this. Mm -hmm. um, as you would see, and let's go back yeah. to verify, as we're going to check when Alice reveals the winner. Mm -hmm. um, and we're saying this is, you know, SHA-256 of, of, of something very similar on line 88, right? It's like in the contract, we're going to make sure this is what it, what it is. And it results to be the same, right? So that's why Alice does that. All right. Then we've got a hash for Alice. We need to get a public key for each of the parties. So this is using some key derivation so that we're not using the root identity keys in the contract. But basically what it means is Alice now has a public key for the purposes of this contract, not just for the purposes of identifying herself. And Bob has a public key for the purpose of this contract as well. Right. Um, we then actually convert these to the correct types using some type coercion. Um, so we just make sure they're script types, pub key types. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we go from there. The timeout is, of course, here. And we ran through this before, I think, yesterday. So yeah. uh, timeout is based on the date plus, uh, I believe, 60 seconds. Uh, and then we actually make a new instance of the contract using these things. And that's how that goes. Mm -hmm. Uh, the offer script is actually the unlocking script. So that's there. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to make the transaction. So we actually say create action, you know, flip a coin. Here's the output. We put it in the baskets. If we can see it, here's the amount we're challenging for. And uh, that's about it, right? Right. Then we send it off to Bob. And we say, hey, Bob, I'd like to challenge you. Here's a challenge transaction. It includes the, the choice that I chose just for the UI for cosmetics. And then here's the actual transaction itself. Right? Yep. 
then we say rejection reason is either uh, expired or uh, rejected. Mm -hmm. And we skipped over this for loop, but let's open it up now. So for each, for let i is zero, as long as i is less than 30 seconds, then we're going to wait for Bob for five seconds. We're going to actually wait for five seconds. We're then going to um, see if there are any new messages from the response box from our peer serve. So peer serve is this message box. First, we're sending to the inbox of Bob with this challenge, and then we're waiting for it to respond in the responses box, hmm. right? We're going to filter out to make sure we only have messages for Bob on line uh, 90. Right. And then we're going to make sure that if there's if there's no messages from Bob in the response box, meaning we haven't heard anything back from Bob, then we are going to just keep, we're going to run continue, which is going to go back to the top of this loop. Mm -hmm. Right. So now we only continue down past this point. Um, uh, we're going to right now make this assumption, which is going to be, uh, you know, uh, tenuous, but, but generally there's only one message from Bob. So we're just assuming this is the first message. Mm. We parse out the message body that Bob sent us back. Mm. And if Bob has the action of accepting, right? No. Then we're going to do some stuff. Of course, if Bob rejected, then we just set rejection reason equals that. Um, and then we're going to acknowledge the message that Bob sent. And then if the rejection reason is rejected, we actually break out of the loop, meaning now we come down to where we were yesterday. Right. But that's how we get out of there. Like that's how we, that's how we handle that. But let's, let's consider that Bob accepted the offer. Alice got accept back from Bob. Uh, the exception, the accepted, the accept transaction, which means Bob, like, uh, spent mm -hmm. the coin successfully is from the accept DX that Bob sent back. So Bob is going to send back a transaction to Alice, which is his acceptance of the contract. Mm -hmm. And we're going to parse that using BSV.transaction. You're going to make a new transaction out of it. And we're going to pull out the first output script, assuming, right? We're making an assumption that is it's the first output, right? Right. So here we see a script that Alice wants to see back from Bob, which is, you know, the script on the output. So how do we look at the terms and conditions as we asked before, right? There's a way to construct a contract using the constructor. There's also a way to construct every contract using from unlocking script. Sorry, from locking script, rather. Mm -hmm. So we actually make an instance, a revelation instance, which we're going to call this, which it should be probably called except instance at this context, but we'll see why it's called revelation instance in a minute, um, from, the, uh, uh, from the locking script. And if you look at hover, hover over this function, it's a function that takes a script and you know some other values which I'm not using, and it recovers a smart contract instance from the locking script of the contract mm -hmm. contains certain properties, right? Or hash, it also allows you to do other, other properties like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, that's, that's basically it, right? Right. Um, you can create a contract instance from the unlocking script. And we actually just say, well, here's the script that we pulled out of the transaction that he sent back. That would throw an error if it was not a valid one of this contract. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then we're going to say, all right, let's make an action. So now we can actually look at Bob's number that he revealed. So if the revelation instance that Bob is when he accepted, if, if Bob's number is Alice's number that she actually picked at the beginning of this function from her perspective, right? Yeah. Then Alice wins. Okay. So Alice can now take the coins, right? Right. So we need to construct a win script for Alice using, you know, uh, the revelation instance dot get unlocking script. And that win script is here. And it takes the call pub. If you look at, remember from yesterday, it takes these two things. It takes call pub yeah. and then it has to set the two and call the unlock method, right? Okay. So wow. we've got a new transaction, which we're going to compute a script for. It's from the TXID of the accept transaction. So we're spending because we won, right? Mm -hmm. 
Alice One. So we're spending the acceptance transaction that Bob is now sending back from Vout Zero. The script that actually Bob made in his output uh, for the acceptance. And then the amount is whatever Alice challenged only multiplied by two, right? Mm -hmm. That's how much this is, the energy value is yep. of that output. Then we're signing with Zcash None, anyone can pay, because um, Alice is, uh, is going to reclaim these coins back. She doesn't have to sign a single. Um, and creates a signature with the pre-image, signature over the pre-image, which is from the transaction, the hash type, input number zero, the script, which is of the acceptance output that she's now redeeming, and the number of Satoshis, which is once again, the amount multiplied by two. Right. Uh -huh. Creates the signature with her key using the Babbage SDK in the same way uh, as we as we did before, as we talked about a little bit briefly yesterday. Yeah. Right? Uh, coerces the signature into the correct type. Adds the hash type. Don't forget to add your hash types. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't. Four hours. Uh, we uh, we set the. Uh, where this contract is going to, which is this neat transaction. Mm -hmm. And then we actually call the Alice reveals the winner thing, where Alice is revealing that she won, and therefore she gets to sign with her signature and says, well, here's my signature from Alice, right? Mm -hmm. And here is my nonce, yeah. because I know that I won. Right? I know what I picked already, so I didn't have to check that myself, because I, I already knew that I picked it originally. Mm -hmm. And then here is the uh, random value. That, that really right. corresponds to that. Unlocking yeah. the points, right? But the script checks that nonce to make sure it's. Oh, right. yeah. The script is going to check it, right? Yes. For the tra when, when the transaction goes on chain. So, all of that to say, we get this win script, right? Mm. That's how Alice gets this script. Oh. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this? now uh, where about a uh, third of the way? It, just a just um, quick question. Um, Alice doesn't actually choose her, choose her number, does she? It's not truly heads or tails because she doesn't no. choose it. It's just done randomly. It is. Why is that? It has to be. Um, well, because, I mean, I guess you could make it one if someone picks heads and zero if they pick tails. But, um, you know, I just generated it randomly here because the heads or tails is cosmetic. And... If I reveal that value to Bob in the message for the UI purposes, mm. then Bob would actually know what Alice chose and, and, and Bob would choose the other number. So I can't reveal it to Bob either way. And right. so I just chose to separate the two and make Alice's random in practice. Okay. The outcome is still the same though. Yes, it Bob, is. Yeah, I accept if that. If you, if you did it that way, you'd be, you'd have to make the, the selection random. All right. Um, whether the one represented heads or the zero represented heads. Uh, like if I pick one and you pick zero, and then somehow do a random like. Yeah. So, so so when you do it in London, you're because you were actually tossing a coin, weren't you? So it's huh. it isn't act. It's that's saying this is how we're going to be doing it, but then you do it using this contract. Uh -huh. So you th that isn't really that's just for effect, just doing uh -huh. a coin toss like that. Well, I think people might think that that is what you're actually doing. That one of you picked heads. Uh -huh. See what I mean? Well, if I reveal like there's an information hiding problem, and we talked. I talked through this with Dan as well. Mm. Uh, if I reveal that, then of course. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm shooting myself in the, in the foot. foot. Yeah. Right. yeah. If, if Bob knows that Alice already picked one or zero, yeah. then Bob oh. can easily pick the other number. Yeah, the problem is oh. that he gets, he could go and look at it on chain. So that's why it has to be done well, the way you're doing it. It's not been revealed by Alice at that point. Well, one of us could just pick, right? I mean, like, I say, oh. okay, I'm picking heads. Okay. You pick zero, one or zero. Like, which one are you? Which one are you picking? Heads? Are you picking one or zero? It doesn't matter, right? So, like, let's say one well, is heads. Right, but let's say it's zero is pick. heads, right? So you're saying you pick zero, okay. right? And then you're telling me that you pick zero. Yeah. 
Okay, so I pick one and I win. No, I pick heads and then you automatically select tails. But but I know and that you randomly pick. select one of them. No, I, I why would I automatically pick tails? <laughs> why would I ever accept well, no, 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 I'm saying Okay. You know how a normal point works? Like where I say yeah. Like what yeah. if we don't both say, you know. Well I'm saying if you could switch the random the randomness instead of from it being the selection of heads or tails, you could move it to like the coin flipping action, right? Like you know that like, I don't know. I haven't really fully thought through it, but would it not work that way? Yeah. So you're saying tie is not possible. Precisely. Alice reveals her hand to Bob. Bob can cheat. There's no. So it's a. It, it goes back to entropy, right? When you think of uh, information theory and entropy, it's like uh, to generate a random number, you need a source of entropy, right? Mm. Yeah. And there is a random outcome in a coin flip. Yeah. So therefore, there has to be a random number, and there therefore has to be a source of entropy. Yeah. Right. If Alice has no hand in that source of entropy, then uh, then Bob can cheat because Bob can try to re-roll and try again until he gets something he wants. And if 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 Bob has no hand because Alice pre-selected, and then Bob has to automatically select. If Bob has no hand in that uh, in that source of entropy, then 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 Alice can can cheat because there's no uh, well, you know you know like the simple like a, like did you ever code up some hopeful like heads or tails if it's less than zero point five I guess there's no decimals though but but who right Correct. fine you can say you know five less than ten or whatever yeah but but who code who runs that on their machine Alice or Bob or a trusted server. And how does that person prove to the other person that it's actually random? How can I generate a random number and then yeah. prove to you <laughs> that I have generated a random okay. number? So that's why you said it this way. Yeah. It, it must be. There's no information theoretic way. It is, a, it is an information theoretic impossibility to compute random entropy uh, provably. Ah. Hmm. It's simply <laughs> I can't prove that it's not right, a, I, from I, I, or some source or something. Um, so it's you know it's an interesting problem. I've, I've thought about it a lot. Like if you if you if you if we solve that, I'm not. I don't want to say it's impossible forever. Mm. I'm saying that like as of now, in terms of the state of yeah. the art mm. of Bitcoin of of, of cryptography, I mean, you know, and I don't have a a complete and total understanding of zero knowledge proofs. Hmm. So, hmm. maybe. Actually, yeah, you could bring it up at uh, okay. the hackathon, couldn't you? Could you actually? Maybe it's something that could be done in a zero knowledge group. Yeah. Um, I can't say hmm. for sure, but but in the classical, conventional, normal way of computing, the way yeah. that you generate a random number between multiple parties is not using a zero knowledge group, but rather by the use of uh, Joint entropy contributions. Yeah. Everybody knows that they each had a hand in the random outcome. I know that I generated a random number and you know that you did. Uh -huh. right? If you always pick one, guess what you don't want to tell me? This uh, always pick one. one. Yes. Because then <laughs> I won't like tell you that to make you think that. It's yes. actually a double. <laughs> <laughs> a double right. blind. That, that's mm -hmm. that's the game theory of random numbers. Uh -huh. Like every party has a secret algorithm for generating random numbers. Good. Right? And that yeah. algorithm isn't public, or at least the inputs to that algorithm are very secret. If I knew your inputs to your deterministic random number generator algorithm, then I couldn't I would be able to deceive you every single time, right? 
So it's a, it's a, it's a secret value in the same way as your private key. The way yeah. that you generate random numbers must be secret. Just like the way that you generate your private key must be secret. Hmm. Yeah. If I tell you that I use this particular uh, deterministic random bit generator to generate my private key, and I passed in this particular sample of atmospheric noise and this particular mm-hmm. Unix timestamp and XORed yeah. it with, you know, I was running 1037 processes in my kernel at that particular moment mm-hmm. and all these different inputs that came in at that time. Yeah. And I didn't tell you my private key, but I said, this is the deterministic method that I use. Here are yeah. the inputs that I use to compute it. Right. Right. Yeah. So you can never prove it to the other person. That's the problem. Right. Yeah. And that's why we have to keep the mechanism by which we compute those things secret. Yeah. yeah. Um, as secret as a private key, which mm-hmm. is actually computed in the same way, randomly. Mm-hmm. So that's why you can't reveal. Because if you did, right, think through, right? If I tell you that I picked one, yeah. you're going to pick zero. Yep. So I tell you, well, I picked something, yep. and the hash of what I picked keep an eye on my hash, but you know it's not going to change. Yeah. Then you pick something, tell me what you pick, and then we'll unblind my hash, and we'll all see who won. Right? Yeah. It's like the digital equivalent of not a coin flip, but imagine I wrote something on a piece of paper, and you wrote something on a piece of paper in the physical world. Mm. And then we say, one, two, three, and at the same time, we reveal them to each other at the same time. Right? Yeah. Or it's like the game of war in cards. Mm. Yeah. Right? And you and I played war once, didn't we? Yeah, we did, and we put down the cards one at the same time. That's like what it is. It's more, it's more like that. Mm. Um, but yeah, the mechanism. And how could you extend this smart contract to be a three-party coin flip, where each party has a one in three chance of winning? Uh, three parties can treat. Right? Yeah, so you just have three numbers. It goes around and makes sure that um, each of them has accepted. Each of them has contributed, and uh, they contributed their portion. Mm. And then the winner is revealed after all of the, um, uh, you know, after the random. So, like, the first party could pick a random number between uh, 0 and 2, yeah. 0, 1, or 2, and blind that. And then everyone could hedge on that and know that it's not going to change. And the first party reveals uh, at the end, right? Mm. And um, and then whoever that number is, that index of that participant would, would win. It would be mod 3. And mm. you play mod three, mod five, yeah. any number of people. Mod a million, have a lottery. Just yes. You can do it. Yeah. It's all fun. We can do whatever we want. This is mm. an script. Just contract. You can code up whatever you want. People already coded up a lottery, actually. Mm. Oh. So anyways. Mm. Right. Now we understand why we can't do yeah. uh, the 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 revelation yeah, that way. The way you would think would be natural, but it's right. counterintuitive, yeah. I get it. Yes. But it is necessary. Yeah. So should we return back to our Yep, sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. I'd like yeah. to make sure we're clear on this, and I think we are. Yes. Uh, and I'm glad that we went That was that. worrying me from the start, you know. So. <laughs> and I will explain that up on stage. Yes. Take all the time during the uh. <laughs> <laughs> if someone really, really, really pushes on it. Or else that I can talk to you about that after the event. Like yes. The first question I ask you is, why did you not tell <laughs> me? <Or> actually, <laughs> if you do that, I will use all people to explain. Or I can say, just we didn't, you know, we'll talk about that after after the event. Yeah. 